Jasna disagreed quite vehemently. Without the experiences we shared in that plant, none of those people would have moved in the directions in which they've moved since then. Every single one of those people would have been a factory worker today. Well, of course I can't be sure about that, but I do know that hardly any of them are factory workers today, and what changed them was the time we spent together. Do you think Claude would ever have left his first factory job if something extraordinary hadn't happened to him? Of course they all came there with personality traits. That's why they all responded so differently. When I got to know Vera, she boasted she'd been a troublemaker in high school during the war. She'd given speeches attacking the occupiers. But the mere ability to give speeches wasn't enough. She'd have lost this ability as soon as she was fired for giving a speech and had to find another job. If she'd gotten a job in a place where the noise drowned her out or where talk wasn't allowed, she'd have been as quiet as anyone else. She was talkative already in high school, but she became a self-assured social reformer only after she ran into Louisa. And what personality traits did Mark have? His conceit came from his having been one of the brighter students in a provincial school where over half the students miss school for several weeks every spring and fall because of farm work and every winter because of lack of transportation. His conceit would have been knocked out of him by any normal group of city workers who were as educated as he was. If Louisa hadn't considered him such a genius, he'd never have dreamed of going to the university, and he'd never thought himself able to occupy the post he occupies today. When Mark started to climb to those high posts, it became clear to me what kind of people occupy them. Nor would Adrian have gotten where he is now on his own. He merely drifted in the direction the rest took, which is all I've ever done. Neither Adrian nor I would ever have drifted out of the factory if we hadn't been able to drift along with the others. Myrna asked why her brother had remained unaffected by Louisa and by all the excitement we had shared. Jan wasn't like the rest of us, Jasna said. Neither was Titus. It's funny. I've seen much more of Titus than any of the others. I've known him since the war and I saw him frequently during the past 20 years, but I don't understand him at all as well as I understood the others. I never really got to know him. If he took part in discussions at all, it was only to advise others to be patient. After his first year in the plant, he no longer said anything about the experiences he had shared with Louisa. I don't suppose he changed during those years any more than Jan did, but I don't know to what extent Louisa affected him before I met him. I do know that Jan wasn't affected by Louisa. He opposed Louisa the very first day he came to the plant. He ridiculed her. He said that if, if he had been one of the workers who had ousted a plant's owners and managers, he couldn't imagine why in the world he would return to the plant the next day unless he had some personal use for one of the machines in the plant. He said he couldn't imagine a situation in which workers ousted all social authorities and then continued doing what they had done before. He even accused Louisa of lying. He said no worker he'd ever known would return to work if he no longer had to. Much as I admired Louisa, I was convinced by Jan every time he argued with her. If Jan had had his way, none of us would have gone back to the plant the day after Mr. Zagad was thrown out. Or we'd have gone back only to throw out Mr. Zagad's machinery. Of course, if we'd done what Jan wanted, we'd have been arrested even sooner than we were. Since you didn't do any of those things, why were you all arrested, Myrna asked. Didn't you know, Jasna asked. I figured that out, or rather, it was explained to me during my year in prison. Every one of our signs was different from the official signs. Yaristan, Louisa, and sometimes Vera argued all night long to make our signs different. Jan had absolutely nothing to do with that. He even refused to take part in the printing and distribution of our signs after Mr. Zagad was ousted. He grumbled that by continuing to work inside those factory walls without tearing them down, we were only imprisoning ourselves. And he was right. You were arrested because your signs were different? Yara asked. And I was so stupid I didn't know at the time, Jasna said. During one of my first days in prison, in the dining hall, a woman asked why I had been arrested. I honestly told her I didn't know. The investigator's questions had been totally incomprehensible to me, and I didn't understand the accusation either. The woman then asked what I had done during the days of the coup. I told her I had printed slogans on signs and marched around with the signs like everyone else. Eventually, she asked me what my slogans were on the signs. As soon as I started to describe some of them, all the women in the dining hall began to laugh at me. Several days later, I asked one of the women why everyone had laughed at me. She asked with disbelief if I really hadn't known that every one of my slogans was a parody of the official slogans. Wherever the official signs had the word state, our signs had the word workers. Wherever the official signs had said party, our said union. Wherever their signs said power, our said self-management. I felt like an absolute idiot. I had been totally unaware of these differences. To me, all the signs in the streets had looked identical. It was only after I learned about these differences that I remembered all the arguments between Louisa, Vera, and Titus about the slogans that were to go on our signs. At the time, I thought they were arguing in a foreign language. I still don't understand why this was so important. If I didn't see our signs as any different from anyone else's, I'm sure no one else did either. I'm sure the police were the only ones who were aware of these differences. Yarosten, surely you knew why we were arrested. You and Louisa attached so much importance to those differences. 
The differences mattered to Mark and Adrian only because you and Louisa thought them so important. I didn't know anything about them. When I was arrested, I insisted I hadn't ever done anything in my whole life. I hadn't even the nerve to take part in the resistance against the occupiers who killed my father. But my protests were all irrelevant. The trial rolled over me like a locomotive, and no matter how loudly I shouted, I couldn't affect its course. I didn't understand a thing. I don't remember all the accusations that were thrown at me. At the time, I didn't even know what the word sabotage meant. I was nevertheless sentenced to a year in prison. How is it possible that Louisa spent only two days? She, at least, knew why she was there. Prison life was a nightmare for me. Most of the women I met were mean to me. After I made such a fool of myself, I became the prison dunce. One woman told me that after my year was over, I'd automatically get another sentence because during the first year I had become a jailbird and therefore a socially dangerous person. And she said there was no telling how long the next sentence would be, but that one-year terms were unheard of. Another woman filled me with horror stories about the torture chambers to which I'd be sent. I shook with fear every waking moment I spent there. I was so relieved when I finally left that hell. Luckily, my house was exactly as I'd left it. It hadn't been confiscated. I decided I'd never again take part in political groups. I'd never again carry signs or go to demonstrations. I stuck to that decision until a few weeks ago. But I took part in the activities in our school only because everyone else is taking part in them. In that situation, it would require bravery not to take part. I gave Jasna a brief summary of my miserable experience after my first release and asked if she had been able to find a job. I was so glad to be out of that prison that nothing else mattered, she said. Of course I was lucky to have that little house. I had also saved some money. I did look for a job and had experiences similar to yours. I went to the carton plant first. The people in charge were apes compared to Mr. Zagad. Of course they turned me down. I was turned down at three other factories as well. But I didn't care. I had enough money to buy groceries for several months, and my little house had been paid for since before the war. I just read and waited to see what would happen. I envied the courage of women like Sophia and Sabina. I didn't have the nerve to leave the house and go looking for adventure. Not on my own. I read. I thought. Mainly I felt sorry for myself. I was completely lost. I knew that my savings would run out eventually. I knew I couldn't just stay inside my house. But the prison term had made me unemployable. There was nothing I could do. It was only some months after I was released that I began to feel the way you must have felt. Fear took hold of me. I was afraid of my neighbors because they seemed to look at me funny. They seemed to think me strange. I remembered what I had been told about being a dangerous convict. I was afraid of the police. I was afraid of strangers on the street. I didn't know anyone. I was 28 years old, and I was deathly afraid to leave my house. Yara was moved. We didn't know what you'd been through when we called you a traitor for not pay taking part in the demonstrations. I'm sorry, she told Jasna. Don't be sorry, Jasna said. You and your friends were right. People who are afraid of their own shadows aren't very admirable. I had good reason to be afraid, but not of everything and everyone. Not all the time. I didn't think of killing myself. That takes courage, too. I just didn't know what to do. So I waited. I don't know what would have happened to me if Vera hadn't literally saved me from some awful death or from insanity. Vera was released almost a year after I was. Her apartment had been confiscated. She didn't have any living relatives, and she hadn't been able to locate any of the other people we'd worked with. She had nowhere in the world to go. How happy she was when she saw it was I who opened the door of my house. She was overjoyed to learn I was living alone. But her happiness at seeing me was nothing compared to mine. I hugged her and acted as if my father as well as my mother had returned home. I begged her to stay with me and to treat my house as if it had always been hers. Vera was completely transformed by her prison term. She was quiet and bitter. I was grateful to her for coming to me. I did everything I could for her. I shopped, cooked, cleaned the house. Vera spent every day outside the house, meeting people, learning what openings might be available for her. I'm embarrassed to admit how quickly she oriented herself. During almost a year, I had assumed everything was close to me, and I did nothing. Vera had only been with me for a week when she began talking about enrolling in college. She said that was the only way to become someone nowadays. Furthermore, it was, it was an alternative that wasn't close to former prisoners. A few weeks later, she was enrolled in the university. She expressed relief about the fact that she'd been turned down at every factory where she had applied for a job. She said she might have gotten stuck in one. By enrolling in the university, she acquired a small stipend as well as a large hope that she'd never have to look for factory work again. I made a comment about the passage near the end of your letter where you described the students in your course. I compared Vera to those former workers who, in your words, are repairing and painting themselves in order to get out of the factory. That's not really a fair comparison, Jasna said. That was literally the only alternative avail available to her and to me. We looked for factory jobs and we were turned down. But you're not altogether wrong. We had all decided to get out of the factory work but several years earlier. 
The hope that we never work in factories again was born during the days when we worked at the carton plant together. It was then that Vera dreamed of becoming something like a popular tribune, some type of public speaker, exactly what she is now. Our experience in the carton plant taught every one of us that we didn't have to spend our lives doing that work. It was on that point that Jan always disagreed with Louisa. Jan continually said that as soon as we knew we didn't have to do that work, none of us would ever return to it. I objected to Jasna's interpretation of Jan's attitude. I know Jan didn't mean that we'd go on to the university and to higher paying jobs, Jasna admitted. He wanted to destroy the factory so that no one would else would have to work in it either. But the rest of us weren't about to do that. We didn't acquire the desire to put an end to factories, but to push ourselves out of them. And that's what Vera did after her release. As soon as she was enrolled in the university, she started teasing and prodding me. She would tell me I was an old maid and would soon become the neighborhood witch if I stayed locked up in the house. She told me that if I enrolled in college, I'd get a stipend for workers and one for war orphans, since I was both. And if I graduated, I'd never again have to work in a factory. But if I waited any longer, I'd be older than the professors. I was afraid. I was sure that a dunce like I was had no place in the university. I remembered the woman who had laughed at me in prison. I imagined all the students at the university would laugh at me for merely enrolling. One day Vera told me she had learned about a college that was specifically designed for dunces and geese, the College for Teachers. She assured me I'd have no trouble being accepted there. She was right. I applied and was accepted. I attended for four years and was no more of a dunce than anyone else. At the end of four years, I was a teacher. But I'm going too fast again. During my second year in college, we got a surprise visit from Adrian Pavershan. He had just been released, and he needed a place to stay. Suddenly, my little house was full for the first time since the war. I expected you to be our next visitor. I told Jasna that I hadn't known where she lived. Neither did Adrian, but he found out easily enough, she said. I had to admit that it had never occurred to me to look her up. I thought she would be offended. But she laughed. I don't know what, it, what would have happened if you'd come. Vera stayed in what used to be my parents' room. Adrian moved into the living room. He thought he'd take up with Vera where he left off. The first thing he did was to enroll in the university. I'm not the one to say it, but Adrian is really dumb. He didn't even suspect that anything strange was going on. It wasn't until ten years later that he found out about Vera's relationship with Professor Kren. Myrna and I begged to tell us the details of Vera's adventures. I'm sorry I'm jumping around so much, Jasna said. I don't know what to tell first. I had known about the professor long before Adrian came to stay with us. During her first year at the university, Vera had told me about a certain Professor Kren who taught a course in political economy which she attended. She described him as an incredibly sleek politician who came to class in a spotless black suit. He lectured for two hours about the transformation of society and about revolutionizing the living conditions of the working people. After his lecture, students lined up on the street to watch him enter his chauffeur-driven limousine and be driven away to the government palace. He was a high official in the state bank. Later on, he became the head of the bank. It's funny how Vera's views of that professor changed during that year. When she first told me about him, she ridiculed him and called him a revolutionary who had servants. Gradually, she told me less and less about his sleekness and his limousine, and more and more about his position, his importance. She also told me he wasn't married. Two or three months before Adrian returned, she told me she was madly in love with Professor Kren's limousine and with his power. She attended every lecture he gave at the university. She even went to hear lectures she'd heard before. And Adrian, who was two years behind her in school, simply assumed she was specializing in the things taught by Professor Kren. When she graduated, she enrolled in a program of postgraduate studies under Professor Kren. After I graduated, I got my first teaching job in a primary school on the other side of the city. But my domestic drama and my first teaching job ended abruptly before I taught for half a year. All three of us were suddenly arrested. Myrna was stunned. You were arrested a second time? Why? she asked. I was stunned too. I don't know why, Jasna said. And that time, no one explained it to me. The first time, I had at least been doing something. The second time, I was doing absolutely nothing. That happened 12 years ago. Suddenly, everything came to an end, and that terrible nightmare started all over again. The searches, the investigations, the cells. And for no reason at all. During my first few months as a teacher, I had done everything exactly as I had been taught. I had gone to school on time, I had spoken only to people I knew, and even then, I had only said good mornings and good night. In my class, I had repeated what the textbook said, and I hadn't added a word of my own, even when I'd known the textbook was wrong. I asked her what she was accused of. Only God knows, she said. They asked me such ridiculous questions. They asked me about things I couldn't possibly know, and mixed up these questions with the questions about things I couldn't help but know. They asked if I knew some notorious foreign spy, and then they asked if I knew my own friends. It was all so stupid. They had arrested me together with Vera and Adrian, and they asked if I knew them. When I admitted knowing them, they insisted I must know the spy, and the whole thing started all over again. 
They even had a wrong last name down for Sophia and Louisa, but I didn't correct their mistake. The people hired to do these interrogations are even dumber than I am. But suddenly, when I had been in jail only two days, I was released. Myrna and I again expressed our surprise. Yes, I was released after two days. I never did find out why we were arrested. I obviously didn't go to a lot of trouble to find out why I was released. The same officials who'd been ready to chop my head off if I didn't tell them things I didn't know were suddenly so polite, so full of smiles and handshakes. They bowed to me and apologized. They told me my arrest had been a mistake. Such mistakes could take place at any time, several times a year. By the time I got home, my fear came back. The day after my release, I went to my school to teach. The head of the school told me he had learned about my arrest and had already replaced me. And he said there were no other openings in the school. I was heartbroken. I had lost the job for which I had studied for four years. My house was empty again. Adrian and Vera were both gone, God knows for how long. I was all alone, and once again I didn't know what I'd do. As if my misery wasn't complete enough, I had a bad experience a few days after I was released. There was a loud knock on the door. I thought the police had come to get me again. I peered out the window and recognized Claude Tamnich. He looked strange. I trembled as I opened the door and immediately regretted letting him in. He slammed the door shut and slapped me host so hard I fell on the floor. He accused me of having, having caused his arrest. I bawled like a baby. I told him I had just been arrested myself for no reason at all, and that, as a result, I had lost my job, my only two friends, and my whole reason to remain alive. His anger decreased somewhat because he could see I was ready to die right on the spot where I lay on the rug. He accused me of having told them he was a member of a spy ring organized from abroad. I told him they'd asked me about spies, but I'd never had anything to do with any spies. I told him they'd asked me if I knew him and all the other people I knew, and of course I told them I knew them. They knew perfectly well we had worked together. But Claude insisted they wouldn't have released me so soon if I hadn't told them he was a spy. When I told Claude they'd apologize to, to me for making a mistake, he said, literally, they never make mistakes. Then why, I asked him, didn't he go and ask them why they had released me and what I had told them? I said they hadn't ever slapped me the way he had. Claude muttered that I must have told them, but he helped himself up and apologized. Years later, I learned why I was released so suddenly. It wouldn't really have mattered if I'd known at the time. Claude rushed in and slapped me before I even had a chance to say hello. I don't know how I convinced Claude I was innocent. He suddenly lost interest in my guilt or innocence. He asked if I had anything to drink, and then he started asking about the people we used to know. He continued drinking until he'd swallowed almost every bottle of alcohol Vera and Adrian had accumulated in my house during all the years they had lived there. He seemed to pour it all into a barrel. The more he drank, the more he told me about himself. He had been arrested along with the rest of us at the carton plant at the time of the coup and had been sentenced to four years. But he was released after he'd only served one year of his term. He boasted about it. He was stinking drunk. He said it was the easiest thing in the world to be released from prison. All you had to do was carry out your obligations to the state, like any good patriot. I asked him what he meant by that, and he told me that in prison he had spied on other prisoners. At the end of his first year, an official asked him if he wanted an important job. Claude didn't turn it down. He said that after he'd taken part in ousting the enemy of the working people, he wasn't going to spend four years in prison only to return to his job in the carton factory, and he certainly wouldn't return now that Mark was head of that factory. I asked if he meant our Mark. Exactly the same Mark, he said, and he called Mark a worm who had wiggled his way into the leadership of the factory's party organization. So Claude accepted the important job they offered him. He became a police spy. He didn't describe the work he did, and I didn't ask him about it. He did boast that he was so good at it, he was promoted a few years later. I can't remember what kind of post he got. He became some kind of different prison official or security administrator. He was put in charge of other people who did the spy work he had done earlier. And then he was suddenly arrested, accused of conspiring with foreign agents to overthrow the state. They had asked Claude, too, if he knew the rest of us. And when he said they knew me, they told him that I, Jasna Zbroka, had admitted that he and I had both been members of that foreign espionage ring. I asked him why they would have released me if I had admitted being a foreign spy, but he was too drunk to answer that. He only ranted about efficiency. He said that's the way they do things, and that's the only efficient way. And then he fell asleep in his chair. I locked myself in my room. When I got up the following morning, Claude was gone. I haven't seen or heard from him since. I don't know if all the things he told me while he was drunk were true, but only one of those things mattered to me. He had told me that Mark Glavney had become an important person in the carton plant. Yara had started to yawn during Jasna's narrative, but at this point she perked up her head and asked, do you mean Mark Glavney, the government official? Was that the Mark who used to be a friend of yours? Yara was obviously impressed by the fact that we had once been the friends of that conceited provincial who had con considered the rest of its half-wits. He's exactly the same Mark, Jasna said. I went to see him the day after Claude's surprise visit. He was there all right, in Mr. Zagad's office. 
He recognized me, but not as a former friend. He didn't remember me as the person who had helped him learn his job at that very plant, as the person who repaired his blunders. I'm sure if you asked him, he wouldn't admit that Yarostan and I had ever been his friends. He recognized me only as someone he had seen before, someone whose name he knew, and that was all. He wasn't unkind. I don't want to suggest that. He was every bit as cordial and decent and as courteous and distant as Mr. Zagat had been the first time I had walked into that very office nineteen years earlier. The scene was an exact repetition of the earlier scene. Only Zagat's role was being played by the boy wonder from the pr provinces whom Louisa had liked so well. I asked if there were any openings. Mark said that there just happened to be one opening, and they would be very happy to have me. Mr. Zagad couldn't have said it any differently. The only difference was that this time I didn't have to apologize for my lack of experience. This time I had infinitely more experience than the man who was hiring me, and I didn't need Louisa to tell me I could carry out my task more efficiently without the boss. It was then that I realized Louisa had been wrong, and Jan had been right. Without the rest of you around me, I hated the work in that plant. If I hadn't had to support myself in that way, I'd never have returned to that boring routine, even if all the Mr. Zagads and Glavnies had been ousted. Jan was right. Those eight-hour days were the nearest thing to prison. He had always objected to Louisa's comments by saying that only an idiot and a br or a brainless mechanical slave would return to his prison cell after all the gates were open and all the guards were gone. I wasn't at all as pleased with myself when Mark hired me as I'd been when Mr. Zagad had hired me. I hated every minute of it. At night, I dreamed of going back to teaching, but I only dreamed about it, and every day I went back to work there. I'm such a timid person. I stayed in that plant for three more years. My body and my mind got numb. I became what Jan had described, a brainless, mechanical slave. I wasn't in any way distinguishable from my alarm clock. I went off at the same hour every morning, wound myself up every night, and went off again the following morning. During those three years, Mark rose to yet another post. He became a member of the City Planning Commission. He had the power to help me find another teaching job simply by talking into his telephone. I didn't know where I found the nerve to go into his office one day to ask his help in transferring me to a teaching job. I told him how many years I'd spent preparing to be a teacher, and I don't know where he found the nerve to turn me down. No, he said, without any explanation. I'm sorry, comrade, but... For the first time in my life, I wanted to do something violent. I had a strong desire to push the desk into his belly, the god's old heavy desk. I'm proud of what I did after that. I walked out of his office, through the workshop, out to the street, and straight to my house. I haven't once returned to that plant since. Several of the workers came to my house to ask if I'd been fired. I told them that I had simply quit because I'd had enough. And every one of them congratulated me for my courage. It was the only time in my life when I was congratulated for my courage. I asked Jasna how in the world Mark had become so important in the carton plant. The same way we all became what we are now, she said. He started to rise the first day he took part in the political discussions we had 20 years ago, when he elaborated those schemes that Louisa admired so much. The workers at the plant were familiar with every step of his rise. They told me all about him during those three years I spent there. Sometime later, Titus Zabrin told me some funny things about him. Mark, too, was arrested 20 years ago. He was released after half a year in jail. I've never allowed myself to wonder why he was released so soon. That only leads to wondering why most of the people around me weren't arrested at all. And once you start thinking things like that, nothing makes any sense. After his release, Mark applied for his old job at the carton plant and was turned down by the new officials. Some of the workers I worked with later on had been there at the time of his rejection, and they told me how surprised they were when he turned up at the plant again several months later. He thought he must have had important contacts already then, so soon after his release from prison. This mystery was clarified for me by Titus sometime after I walked out of Mark's office. After being turned down by the plant officials, Mark learned that Titus had some kind of trade union post. He visited Titus, and with a single telephone call, Titus got Mark hired at the carton plant. This same Mark refused to do that much for me several years later. As soon as he had his old job back, Mark started to attend night classes at the university. It was an educational program paid for by the union to give rank-and-file workers diplomas with which they could apply for posts in the union bureaucracy. I commented that Mark must have attended a program similar in purpose and content to the program of the institution where you teach. And Mark certainly used it to his fullest advantage, Jasna continued. He was a good student, as he'd always been. He enrolled in a course in economic planning, which must have suited his talents perfectly. After attending the course for a year, he was appointed to the plant council and got his own office. That was all he needed. From that point on, he merely rose. He continued to be paid by the carton plant, although he no longer did any work. He spent his days in his office studying for his courses. He did so well in his studies that he was appointed party secretary of the plant council. This appointment automatically made him a member of the trade union council. 
When he finished his course, he had higher academic credentials than anyone else in the plant, and he rose yet another notch. This time he was, quote, elected head of the plant's party organization. He spent the next two years inside his office, writing a dissertation based on statistics collected for him by minor union officials in the plant. He became Dr. Glabney. What happened to him next was funny to the workers who told me about it. Late one night, a car pulled up in front of Dr. Glabney's house. Two men knocked at his door, and they arrested him exactly the same way they would have arrested any ordinary saboteur. But unlike ordinary saboteurs, Dr. Glavney was immediately released. I was told that the regional party secretary personally took a trip to the prison to apologize to Dr. Glavney for the mistake. After his release, Mark wasn't only reinstated in all his posts. He also became a representative in the city planning commission. It was then that I went into his office and asked his help in transferring me to a teaching job. I haven't seen him since that day, but two people who still work there have children in the school where I teach, and they've kept me informed about his continuing successes. Shortly after I walked out of his office never to see him again, Dr. Glavney became general manager of the carton plant. The following year, he became a member of the State Planning Commission and also the Foreign Trade Commission. Only last year, I read in a newspaper that he had become a member of the Central Committee of the State Planning Commission. Today, you can keep up with his title simply by reading the newspapers. He's mentioned at least once a day. We asked Jasna if she had gotten a teaching job on her own after she left the carton plant. I didn't even try, she said. I, again, did absolutely nothing for several months. I had grown so used to spending months at home doing nothing. You really did absolutely nothing, Yara asked with disbelief. Did you just sit home and stare? I mean nothing outside of my house, Jasna said. No, I didn't sit there and stare. I didn't feel particularly sorry for myself anymore. Although what I did do amounts to nearly nothing. I have a weakness for reading novels, especially long novels, and the periods where I did nothing were in many ways the fullest periods of my life. Those were the months where I lived all the possible lives I was never going to be able to lead in real life. During that time, I was vaguely aware that Vera had been released. I wondered why she didn't visit me, but I made no effort to try and see her. I just stayed home and read. My reading spree came to an end when I got another surprise visit. Titus Zebrin came to see me. We hadn't seen each other in more than ten years. He had recently been released from prison. I think his arrest had been another mistake. He worked in the trade union bureaucracy, and he somehow learned that I quit my job at the carton plant. I learned from Titus that Jan had disappeared, that you were still in prison, and that Myrna and your two daughters lived in my own neighborhood. But you never came to see us, Yara said reproachfully. I always intended to visit, Jasna told us, but I'm such a timid person. I was afraid. Titus was shocked when I told him I just stayed home and read. He asked why I had walked out of Mark's office. When I told him, he asked me with the seriousness of an old official what kind of work I'd like to do. I told him I wanted to teach again. Two days later, he visited me again and told me there was an opening for me in the elementary school in my own neighborhood. I was overjoyed. I prepared a feast for him. I was so grateful to him. He visited me quite frequently after that, but I couldn't get any closer to him than when we worked together years earlier. This time it wasn't because I had to compete against the incomparable Luisa Nacholo, but because Titus had grown so dull, so robot-like, so official. He was hardly more human than an office desk. I continually asked him about his life, but unlike everyone else I had known, he had no desire at all to talk about himself. It was like pulling his teeth to get to him to tell any details. He didn't tell me a single thing I didn't specifically ask him. That's why I know only fragments of his life. After we were all driven from the carton plant in so many different directions, Titus got a post in the, in the trade union. It was through this post that he was able to help Mark get rehired at the carton plant. He told me he had been in prison for, quote, cosmopolitanism, whatever that was. The second time he was arrested, he was charged with, quote, revisionism. I never heard of the things he was accused of. He seemed extremely lonely and told me he had no friends at all. I could see why. He was as sociable as a stone. About four years ago, when I had been teaching again for over a year, after Yara had already en enrolled in our school, Titus told me he had seen Adrian, who had just been released from a second term two years before your release. Adrian had visited Titus to ask help finding a job. Titus found Adrian a job in the trade union council. Titus didn't know where Adrian was living, but he told me where his office was. I was annoyed by the fact that Adrian hadn't come to see me after his release. I hadn't seen him since we'd have been arrested at my house six years earlier. I got a substitute to replace me in school one day and went to his office. Adrian and his office were both terribly depressing. Adrian had grown as skinny as a skeleton. Dark rings surrounded his eyes. His face and his hands seemed to consist only of skin and bones and his office was just as sparse as he was. It was larger than the average prison cell. It had a desk and a chair, but that was all. There was nothing on the walls, nothing on the floor, nothing on the desk. We shook hands. I couldn't keep myself from asking what in the world he did in that room. Looking around the bare walls, he said, This is my job. 
I'm a researcher. I asked him exactly what Yara just asked me. Did he just sit there and stare at the walls? Didn't he ever read? He pulled the sports section of a newspaper out of the top drawer of his desk to show me that he did read. I could see that there was nothing else in that desk drawer. As if to explain his situation, he told me he was waiting. Waiting for what? I asked. All day long? Every day? He reminded me that before his arrest he had been on the verge of finishing his studies at the university. If he had taken three more exams and submitted one paper, he would have finished. His paper was written and he was waiting to take the exams. After that he'd get another appointment. Adrian was simply sitting in that office, waiting for the appointment. He literally had nothing to do there. I spent most of the day in, in his office. I, I asked him why he hadn't come to see me after he was released. I'd gladly have put him up again in the same room where he'd stayed before. He said he couldn't stand anything that reminded him of Vera. And then, calmly, almost mechanically, he started telling me what had happened to him after he was arrested. I couldn't believe what he was telling me, although it clarified why I had been released so quickly and why I had been told I'd been arrested by mistake. Adrian had also been accused of having contacts with the foreign spy ring, and he too had been asked if he knew the people we all knew, including Vera and Mark. Of course he'd admitted knowing them. He was sentenced to two years. At the end of the two years, instead of being released, he was swept into another trial. I was reminded of the story a woman had told me during my first prison tune. As soon as one term ended, a longer one began. That was what happened to Adrian. He was interrogated again. This time the interrogators wanted to, him to deny he had ever known Veronese or Mark Glavney and to say he had lied at the first trial. I told Jasna I'd had similar experiences during my second prison term. At one trial they asked me to admit I knew all my friends and I was sentenced to eight years because I refused to admit I'd ever known any of them. I thought I'd get into trouble if I admitted knowing them. At the same time I didn't know most of them had already been arrested. Some two years later an interrogator asked me to sign a paper to the effect that I had never known Vera or Mark. I obviously signed it since I'd already told them I didn't know them. I thought I couldn't possibly harm people by admitting I never known them. But that wasn't Adrian's situation, Jasna said. First of all, he, Vera, and I had been arrested together, so the interrogators would have known perfectly well that he was lying when he said he didn't know Vera. Secondly, he was sure they were trying to trap him or Vera into contradicting each other so as to build a case against one of them. He thought he was protecting Vera by refusing to sign that paper. He told me he was completely dumbfounded by the trial. During his remaining four years in prison, he couldn't figure out what had happened. It all became clear to him only after he was released, when he finally located Vera's office and saw the plaque on her door. At that trial, he was accused of perjury, intentional defamation of the characters of two important state officials. The prosecutor railed against Adrian as a known foreign agent who had tried to implicate Veronese and Mark Glavney in his spy ring. Adrian was supposed to have caused the arrest of two comrades above suspicion by claiming they were members of his group. The prosecutor told the court that Comrade Veronese, full professor of political economy, had been cleared of this malicious slander through the personal intervention of Professor Dr. Kren, head of the state bank. Comrade Mark Glavney, head of the party organization of the Carton Factory and representative of the City Planning Commission, had been cleared through the personal intervention of the head of state planning commission. For this malicious slander, Adrian was sentenced to four more years in prison. During all those years, he wrestled with the significance of that trial. All he figured out was that Mark and Vera must have been released and that his denial that he had known them might have been needed to expedite the release. He said if he'd known that during the interrogation, he would gladly have signed the paper. Everything finally cleared up after he was released. He went to the university and looked for Vera Nice. He was told there was no such person. Someone told him to ask in the rector's office. Imagine his surprise when he saw the plaque on the door. Rector of the Faculty of Political Economy, Professor Dr. Vera Krenna. Adrian then remembered the name of the bank official who had personally intervened to release Vera. Yara was impressed once again. Do you mean Vera Krenner, the minister? Was that the Vera niece you used to know? She wasn't a minister yet when Adrian found her office, Jasna said. Adrian told me he hesitantly went in. There were three secretaries there. They asked if he had an appointment with the rector. He told them he didn't want to see the rector. He only wanted to learn something about her because he had known her once, in high school, as Vera niece. He said he wanted to know how she had come to her present position and asked if they would be willing to tell him. One of the secretaries left the office with him and they went to a coffee shop. She told him she had been Vera's classmate in the university and knew exactly how Vera had become rector of the university. From her, Adrian learned that Vera had begun her affair with Professor Kren already during the days when Adrian and Vera had lived happily at my house. Adrian didn't tell the secretary he'd known Vera after high school. She told Adrian she and Vera had graduated together, and after graduation she had gotten the job as the rector's secretary, and had been on that job ever since. 
But when Vera graduated, she had enrolled in a postgraduate course in political economy so as to become close to the bank official, Professor Crenn. Vera and the professor became inseparable during the day while, according to the secretary, Vera returned to another lover every night. The secretary told Adrian that Vera's career was almost cut short soon after her postgraduate program started because a foreign spy had claimed that she was a member of his spy ring. She was arrested and Crenn himself had to intervene to get her released. My hasty release was suddenly explained. Vera must have asked Crenn to intervene for me as well. Adrian was annoyed when I told him this because he had been the one who'd had to suffer because of Vera's release. He had been left in jail so as not to be in Vera's way. The secretary had told him that Vera had protested to the police for arresting her. Mark apparently did the same thing. The way the police cleared themselves of these mistakes was to put all the blame on Adrian, slapping another four years on him for having implicated Vera and Mark and then announcing they had discovered the cause for their mistake. The woman told Adrian that as soon as Crenn got Vera out of prison, she abandoned her lover and moved into the professor's house. From that point on, she walked on a golden carpet. She finished her studies under him and became Dr. Veronese, the same year when he became the head of the state bank. The following year, she became professor of political economy. Such a quick journey from student to full professor was unprecedented. She was probably the youngest professor in the university's history and one of the few women on the university's regular teaching staff. The secretary said all the men professors were charmed. There was a great deal of talk about the equality of women in all fields of social endeavor, and all of it was a mutual sham. A year later, Vera married the professor, and shortly after the marriage, Professor Dr. Vera Nice Krenna became assistant rector of the Faculty of Political Economy. And then the rector of the university was arrested in the middle of the night by the security police. That happened only a year before Adrian's release. Professor Krenn's candidate for rector, his wife, was unanimously elected to the post. There were no other candidates. After Adrian learned all that, he must have suspected that I had known about Vera's relations with Professor Krenn all along, but he didn't ask. After his session with Vera's secretary, Adrian wanted to look up the other important state official whose character he had defamed by claiming to know him, Comrade Mark Glavny. Adrian went to the carton factory, but Mark no longer occupied Mr. Zagad's office, where I had found him six years earlier. Adrian was told that Dr. Glavny was the general manager of the plant, but that his office was located in the State Planning Commission building. Adrian went to the government building, found Mark's office, but got no further than the desk of the secretary. Adrian was asked his reasons for wanting to see Dr. Glavny. When he said he wanted to apply for a job at the carton factory, the secretary told him that hiring was handled by an official at the plant itself, and she promptly wrote an official's name and number on a slip of paper. Adrian then tried another approach. He telephoned Mark's office, introduced himself as Comrade Crenn from the state bank, and said he needed to discuss urgent business with Comrade Glavny. He was given an appointment for the following day. When Adrian entered Mark's office and introduced himself as Comrade Crenn, Mark's face fell. Mark didn't even shake Adrian's hand. He merely asked Adrian what he wanted. Adrian said he wanted a job at the plant. Mark, flushed with anger, shouted, You want my help after what you've done to me? Couldn't you have told them you didn't know me? You put a permanent blot on my name. Adrian shouted back, A blot on your name? You lunatic? I've just spent six years of my life in prison. What wouldn't I do to have a mere blot on my name exchanged for those six years? Mark didn't respond. He regained his composure, sat behind his desk, and called his secretary to accompany Comrade Crenn out of his office, saying, I'm sorry, Comrade, there aren't any openings for your friend. Adrian was furious when he left Mark's office, but he didn't know what to do. He was miserable for several weeks. Then he somehow learned that Titus Sabrin was a trade union official and went to see him. That was when Titus got him a job in that office where I found him. I told Adrian something about my own life since our arrest, and I invited him to visit me for old time's sake, but he never came. I didn't see him again for a whole year. Titus visited me two or three times during that year. I went to school every day and read my novels at night. And then, was it three years ago? I learned that your older daughter, v Vesna, was sick. I didn't even know her. She hadn't ever been in my class, and I hadn't ever tried to talk to her. I told Titus, but I didn't come. When I learned she had died in the hospital, I felt awful. I cried every night. I even burst out crying during one of my classes. But I just couldn't bring myself to come and see you, Myrna. I'd stayed away so long, and you didn't know me. I was afraid you wouldn't trust me. I had to go somewhere, to see someone. I decided to visit Adrian again. Nothing had changed in his office. The walls were still bare, and there was nothing in the room except the desk and the chairs, and there was nothing on the desk. I asked Adrian if he was still waiting. Adrian told me he had one exam left to finish his studies. He was sure he'd be promoted as soon as he got his degree. I asked him what kind of life that was, waiting in that empty room for a promotion like a prisoner waiting to be released. He told me he had done a great deal since I'd last seen him. 
He had been seeing Vera's secretary regularly, the one who had told him about Vera's successes, although he hadn't yet seen Professor Dr. Vera in person. He had told the secretary that he'd been the one responsible for Vera's arrest. He insisted on telling me the details of his self-exposure. The secretary trapped Vera into admitting she had lied about the foreign spy who had caused her arrest. The secretary had told Vera that in her student days she had met an Adrian Pabershan who had told her he had known Vera in high school. Vera admitted having known Adrian in high school. She even told the secretary she and Adrian had grown up together. When Adrian told the secretary about his arrest, his near release, and the new trial where he was to admit he had never even known Vera, the secretary was indignant. She realized Vera had caused Adrian to be in prison for four extra years merely in order to rehabilitate her name. She wanted to expose Vera's duplicity to make a public scandal. Adrian told me he was pleased by the secretary's reaction, but he begged her not to mention the details to anyone. He was afraid that a scandal would interfere with his coming promotion. I felt a mixture of disgust and shame when I left Adrian's office. I haven't ever gone to see him again. I was disgusted by Adrian. I regretted having gone to see him after I had learned about Vesna's death. I was ashamed of myself, of my life, of all my former friends. I asked Jasna if she knew what all those people were doing today. Oh, I lost track of Claude nine years ago, after the day when he came to my house to accuse me, she said. I don't even know if he's still alive. If he is, he's probably a prison or police official. You don't need to ask me about the others. They're in the newspapers. Vera and Adrian appear together on speakers' platforms. I have no idea how or when they became friends again. Vera has fulfilled her life's dream. She's a popular tribune. She lectures to applauding audiences, talks on the radio at least once a week about the urgent political tasks of the day and the need for reforms. And Adrian is still her straight man. He still documents the things she says. I listen to them on the radio whenever I can. They're not nearly as funny as they used to be. Whenever they're mentioned in the newspapers, their names are accompanied by titles that fill whole paragraphs. Vera is still rector of the university. She's also deputy minister of the Ideological Commission, and I don't know what else besides. Adrian got all the promotions he had waited for. He's first party secretary of the Commission for Problems of Standard of Living. Mark has more titles than either of them. He's a member of the Central Committee of the State Planning Commission. He's on the Foreign Trade Commission. His name is mentioned wherever there's an international trade conference. And me, I get up at the same time every morning and go teach my classes at the elementary school. I'm neither a head, nor a member, nor a party secretary, nor anything else. But somehow, I'm one of them too. I've also abandoned people who were killed and jailed, who suffered because they wanted to live another kind of life. I too am a traitor to people like Jan, who disappeared so many years ago, and to little Vesna, who wasn't even given a chance to survive. Our famous friends have succeeded in getting the life we used to talk about. They got it for themselves. It was very late when Jasna finished. Before she left, she said to me, Be sure you tell Sophia about the people we knew 20 years ago. They don't all deserve the sympathy she expresses for them in her letter. I suspect you know who our friends were and that you're one of them. My suspicion is confirmed by your descriptions of those people and by your description of your life's choices. You describe Mark and Vera as committed revolutionary workers. Louisa regards Jan and me as hotheads. You recognize the repressive aspirations of your university friends, Lem and Rhea, but only because those two people express their aspirations openly. You fail to realize that those who announce their repressive aspirations are not the only carriers of repression. You fail to see through people who do not carry the world of repression in their mouths, but in the motions and decisions they make every day of their lives. Today it doesn't take great insight to see through people like Lem and Rhea. People like them have realized their aspirations in a third of the world, and the repressive character of these aspirations has become public knowledge. You reject Ram Lam and Rhea because they're antiquated, not because they're repressive. You glorify their modern cousins. You glorify Mark, Vera, Adrian, Claude, and those like them in your environment. You describe them all as rebels. I would like to think, as Jasna does, that you don't know what kind of people these are. But I think you do know who they are. I think you use language the same way they do. Not to unveil and to clarify, but to mask and obscure. I think you know that the terms with which you describe these people are the terms behind which they hide. I think you know that terms like independent, committed, revolutionary do not describe the characters or activities of these people. In plainer terms, you're lying about these individuals. Vera, Adrian, Claude, and Mark are people for whom the organized system of repression is the only possible form of life. They perceive their own personal development in the form of active participation in the repression. For them, the university hierarchy, the union hierarchy, the enterprise hierarchy, and the state hierarchy are the hothouses in which human life flowers and grows, and it's within these contexts that they define their choices, their life projects, and their success. Their aim in life is to occupy positions in these hierarchies, to play the roles defined by the previous occupants in their offices. 
They've renounced their own projects and their own lives in order to live what has already been lived. They ran to sell themselves, or sat like commodities in display windows waiting to be bought. And while they grow inside their hierarchies, the rest of us manure the hothouse soil and maintain the heat with our submission and our admiration. Several times during Jasna's narrative, Yar interrupted with comments to express admiration for our one-time co-workers. Even Jasna and I became more admirable to Yara because we had once known these paragons of integrity and solidarity. We shone in the light reflected from these suns. It's true that Yara is only 11 years old, but her admiration nevertheless disappointed me. She happens to be the individual who had so much to do with stirring up the ferment at her school. Her self-assurance in matters that concern her directly, combined with her passive admiration for the occupants of social offices, is identical to the mixture of self-assurance and passivity among my fellow workers in the carton plant, who determinedly oust a union bureaucrat, and then applaud speechmakers waiting to replace the ousted bureaucrat in the same post. From her own experience, Yara knows that she and her friends are able to move the world, while her education has imbued her with the illusion that only the tops of the hierarchies move the world. Yara's admiration for Vera and Mark has much in common with the mirages people experience in a desert. The illusion is caused by the heat, the distance, and the thirst one feels. The mirage continues receding. No matter how far one goes, one seems to get no closer to it. One who does finally reach it finds there is no water, but there is only more sand. The aura which seems to surround the admirable people of our society is an illusion caused by the poverty of everyone's personal life in contrast to this brilliant public life of the personalities daily displayed to thousands. Some of those who watch condense their life projects to one single goal, to be watched, to be seen daily by thousands. But this goal is a mirage. Being watched is no more of an activity than watching. The observed is as passive as the observer. It seems to me that the personal lives of those who occupy the highest offices are as miserable as the personal lives of those who are victimized by the officials. When Mark reached his goal and became manager of the plant, he renounced his own life to such an extent that when Jasna visited his office, she saw in him not the individual we had known, but the previous occupant of the office, Mr. Zagad. Having annihilated himself to such a degree, he turned his back on Jasna and Adrian when they needed his help. Adrian had to serve four years in prison so that a blot could be removed from Mark's name. Adrian's prolonged imprisonment served Vera's interests as well. She could marry her banker without having to explain anything to her lifelong friend. We don't know how many others Mark had to repress in order to rise to his heights, but we have strong grounds for thinking it was Vera or her future husband who removed the previous rector of the university from his post. And Adrian, after having been victimized by both Vera and Mark, outdid both of them. Adrian's self-debasement for the sake of bureaucratic advancement is scandalous. He simply gave all of himself to the bureaucracy. He denuded himself of all internal and external characteristics, of all marks that might even superficially define him as a specific individual, and waited like an unlabeled bottle ready to be filled and sold. Claude had succeeded in attaining his repressive ideal earlier and more grossly. Having repressed his own desires to live without bureaucratic structures, they hid out blindly against all those who had not repressed such desires. I think Louisa shares one trait with her former comrades. I think she, too, a long time ago, gave up her desires for her own self-liberation and gave herself to the last of the repressive institutions, to the representative of liberation, the Union. She poured her life into meaningless drudgery for the sake of that repressive utopia where rank and filers are said to rule when they are ruled by a rank and filer, where workers are said to manage when they are managed by a worker, where the workers are said to be victorious when one of the victors governs. I think this is why Louisa responds so irrationally whenever Ron is mentioned, whenever Manuel, whom she never met, is mentioned, whenever Jan is mentioned. I think she responds that way because these individuals refuse to repress their own desires, because they refuse to submit to the victory of repression called by another name. I was amazed by the exchange between Sabina and Louisa about all those whom Louisa called enemies behind the trenches. Louisa is straightforward when she speaks of saboteurs and assassins as if they were first cousins. To her, people who sabotage production are the same as people who murdered revolutionary workers, and she defends the repression of both. Isn't it perfectly clear that if Louisa's ideal had triumphed, people like Manuel, Jan, and I wouldn't have fared any better than we did? Sabina guessed exactly what Manuel had told me. The revolutionary saboteurs were killed alongside the hired assassins, not by the order of the generals, but by the order of the revolutionary general staff. That's what would have happened to Manuel if he hadn't been arrested earlier because of his membership in an organization to which he no longer belonged when he was arrested. The weekend is over, and tomorrow I return to work. I'd like to end this letter on a more cheerful note. 
I would genuinely like to carry on this correspondence with you in a spirit of understanding and mutual aid, not only for the sake of our past friendship, but also because communication across such large chasms will have to take place if our meager beginnings are going to continue growing and not be drowned in blood spilled by those of our likes who remain under the spell of their rulers. I hope my letter, and especially Jasna's narrative, has at least clarified the character of the individuals and the experiences on which you based so many of your life's choices. Yarastan.